This is what sustainability in Singapore looks like. Solar panels on water and fish farming in the sky. This juxtaposition of two such innovations show how Singapore plans to reduce its carbon footprint and adapt to climate change. This is Tengi Reservoir Floating Solar Farm. With more than 120,000 solar panels, this joint project by National Water Agency PUB and Energy Farm Samcor covers a massive 45 hectares. So the reservoir is the other way to go to solarize Singapore. This is a 60 megawatt project and is about 4% of Singapore's 1.5 gigawatt target. This translates to a carbon emissions offset of 32 kilotons annually, equivalent to removing around 7,000 cars from the road. And the energy from these solar panels will go on to power the production of another scarce resource, especially here in Singapore, water. For PUB, this energy also is able to power all our five water works. So with this project, Singapore will be one of the few in the world to be 100% green in terms of water treatment. You have heard of vertical vegetable farming and community plots on rooftops. But the next frontier for urban farming in Singapore is this. Growing fish not in the sea, but in Apollo Aquaculture's eight-storey facility in Lim Chu Kang. Making a splash in one of these floating ponds are hybrid grouper and coral trout fry. With eight storeys of these ponds, they could potentially yield almost 2,700 tonnes of fish per year. That's six times more than Apollo's pilot three-tit fish farm in the area. The way we farm is really uh, yield less space because we can control all the, what we are farming. And, and also we find very safe in the sense that we don't need to use any antibiotic. And I think we, with this, we can really improve and uh, maximise the, the, the output. Short on space, but not on ideas. By breaking away from the conventional mode, Singapore is scaling new heights in its bid to tackle climate change. Audrey Tan, The Straits Times. Good afternoon and welcome to the launch of the ASEAN Digital Generation Report for 2021. For the past four years, this survey has been conducted by the World Economic Forum in partnership with the consumer internet company Seed Limited. It is being released today in collaboration with the Straits Times of Singapore. My name is Ravi Velour, and I'm an associate editor with the Straits Times and it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Juk Lee, the World Economic Forum's head for the regional agenda in the Asia Pacific to make his opening remarks. Juk, over to you. Thank you very much, Ravi. Um, and good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to everyone joining from the region. A very good morning to you from here in Geneva. Uh, as introduced, my name is Juok Lee. I head up the Asia Pacific Regional Agenda here at the World Economic Forum. 
we're delighted and also privileged to have this collaboration uh, with Straits Times in launching this very important report. We have worked together with the Straits Times here in the region, as well as in different parts of the world over the years. But I believe that this uh, collaboration also bears a very special meaning as we have endured the pandemic and also looked towards recovery uh, and also a light at the end of the tunnel. As Ravi mentioned, the World Economic Forum has closely worked with C Group over the past few years, asking the youth in ASEAN about their perceptions about the region and also about their outlook for the future. And this year's edition really focuses on ASEAN's digital future and ASEAN youth as a digital generation and the broader population as how they see the future unfolding uh, for the region as we enter an era of digital transformation. I'm delighted that we also have an excellent panel discussion waiting to discuss the results and insights gathered from this report. And for the deeper uh, analysis and also uh, interpretation of the findings of this year's survey, I would like to now hand over to our very close partner, uh, C Group and, and Santi. Over to you, Santi. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, uh, Your Excellency Minister Safro, Huetla from the Global Shaper community, and everyone tuning in from home. I'd like to thank you at the Strait Times for hosting this event. We are very excited to launch this ASEAN Digital Generation Survey. And today, um, this is a very special edition of the collaboration that we have with the World Economic Forum that we have been doing for the past four years. Let me dive right into it. This is a very unique uh, report in many ways because it is one of the largest survey in the region that we have. We have over 86,000 completed response across six ASEAN nations. People aged from 16 all the way to 60 years old. We have over 8,000 entrepreneurs coming from the MSME sectors, that micro, small, medium scale enterprises. And today we have eight key findings that we want to share with you. All these findings are revolved around the theme of how does our digital generation think about the future post-pandemic world. So let me start with the first key finding. It's about the pandemic itself. It's about setting the scene and understanding the present. We find that the pandemic has continued to pose significant challenge to the digital generations across ASEAN. We have seen majority of people talking about the decline in income and decline in savings that they have experienced during the pandemic. This is particularly acute when it comes to people working in dining and tourism sector, as well as people who are working in the, as a SME owners. But it's not just the economic impact. We also find that the pandemic has posed significant challenge in terms of the mental health impact as well. Sizable proportion, about 40% of people, have reported they have seen decline in mental health. What's interesting is this is particularly common among women than it is for men. Perhaps this partly reflects the multiple roles and responsibilities that women have to bear during the pandemic, both earning income to support a family as well as taking care of people in the households, which is still very common across Southeast Asia. And perhaps this deep impact of the pandemic has shaped the way people think about the future ahead. 62% of the ASEAN digital generations believe that the world will be completely different after the pandemic. When asked about what are the things that they're worried about, you can see on the left-hand side, they're worried about the risk of another economic and financial crisis. They worry about future pandemics. They worry about misinformation, climate change, and global division, greater inequality. And it's not hard to see why, because most of these issues are precisely the issues that they have to face in one way or the other during the pandemic as well. But that said, it's not all negative. They also sign up optimism. They also think that perhaps this could be opportunity for change for the better. They expect that the world could be and could see better health care. We could be in a more hygienic world. They think that perhaps we can have a more caring society 
as families and communities bond together to help each other through these difficult times. They also expect to see greater technology adoption, which lead to many other benefits, which we will talk about in subsequent slides. And building on that optimistic note, we also see signs that ASEAN citizen has shown resilience and adaptability during these difficult times and have discovered some new opportunities. For example, for people look, working in a wholesale and retail trade sector, about 50% of them actually found new business, most likely through online means. We also found that about one in four people have started new jobs during the pandemic period. The most commonly seen is in the logistics sector. Both of these themes are very much consistent with what we see elsewhere on the growth of e-commerce in Southeast Asia, both giving rise to the new class of entrepreneurs who are digital entrepreneurs, as well as giving rise to the demand for logistics sector. So perhaps not so surprising that we have seen many respondents talking about how they recognize the benefit of digitalization. But somewhat, the numbers is still strikingly high. We find that as high as 87% of MSME owners, the entrepreneurs, believe that the economic recovery will need to, be, re, need to rely on digitalization. And as you dig deeper, you can see why. We found that business with online presence tend to perform better and tend to be more resilient than those without online presence during the pandemic. Also, when you ask the entrepreneurs about what are the benefits of these technologies, you get these five outcomes. Apart from the access to information and automation, which is quite common for everyone, all the respondents would talk about, there are two that's really unique and stand out for entrepreneurs. They talk about the benefits of being able to access goods and services during the pandemic, as well as ability to generate new stream of incomes or sort of diversify their earnings during these difficult times as the key benefits of technology. And therefore, it's not surprising, given all this realization of benefits that technology brings, that there is a high demand to pursue digitalization further, to increase digital adoption further. We ask respondents about the nine aspects of life, um, that they, whether how much they want to actually pursue digital adoption further. That includes shopping, learning, working, doing business, traveling, um, etc. But the most striking, most striking result of all is how much digitalization they want to see more in the area of finance, especially in the area of payments, which rank number one. We find that two thirds of people want to digitalize further the payment process, and as high as 75% of the entrepreneurs want to do the same. Even in an area where it's a little bit more niche, like getting credits, getting loans, we find that majority of entrepreneurs, MSME entrepreneurs to be precise, want to see further digitalization in the process in which they get loans. That's probably reflect how they want to have an easier access to loans, a faster access to loans using technology at the time that they need it most. So we need to have better understanding of how this digitalization journey works so that we can help and support and facilitate it. And one of the most important findings in the report is that digitalization needs momentum. What we found is that people who are already highly digitalized believe that they already use digital. For example, in business, if you ask them and people report that they are already using a lot of um, online tools for their business, these are people who also want to digitalize even further. 80% of this group believe that they want to use technology even more than before, even though it's already high. Whereas the, people, the opposite is also true, where people who haven't really used technology much is also not that keen to close the gap. They don't really want to increase adoption further. Only 35% of them want to do so. So you can see the clear difference between the two scenarios, the blue scenario and the gray scenario. The important question for policymakers and ecosystem builder becomes, how do we shift people from the gray scenario to the blue scenario? So that there's a virtual circle whereby people use technology, they realize the benefits, they are willing to invest and up their skills so they can use technology even better, therefore earning and getting even more benefits out of it. So that's a positive scenario we want to see. But in order to get to that, we need to tackle the barriers 
and the frictions to, to digitalization. Which brings us to findings number seven, which identifies some of the key barriers that people face when it comes to digitalization. By and large, the number one reason across all nations, pretty much um, all nations, is the access to internet itself. It's still the question of infrastructure. Be able to access high quality internet signal, strong stable signal at affordable price remain the most important issue. But as you move away from the first rank, down um, the rankings, things become more nuanced and more interesting. For those who are early stage digital users, so they are not so digitalized yet, the key issues for them is digital literacy, skills and confidence. So upskilling and reskilling for them will be crucially important to get them on board. But for those who are already very digitally active, the concerns shift a little bit more towards trust and security concerns, perhaps reflecting the fact that they're already doing a lot of financial transaction payments online. Therefore, issues of security become ever more important for them. Last but not least, we also ask our respondents how they think, what are the skills that are you, they think going to be most important for the future that they're envisioning. And this is a result you see on the screen. If you take a look at the top four reasons, you can see that it revolves around technology usage, creativity, and innovation, self-discipline, resilience, and adaptability. These are precisely the type of skills they need in order to survive the pandemic, and for some, even thrive during the past year and a half. So it's not too surprising Yet it's very interesting if we take one step deeper and we ask not just what are important, but how proficient you are in these skills. So that's this chart. That's the blue bar. So the way to read this chart is if you take a look at the technology use, that's saying that 39% of the respondents believe technology use is very important for the future. Around 46% of them are proficient in these skills. And then it's not hard to see. If you look at the blue bars in the charts, most of them are below 50%, meaning that there are still gaps, at least perceived skill, skill gaps that need to be bridged. We need to put more effort into reskilling and upskilling um, our workforce in Southeast Asia. And some of that is already happening. We found that about 40% of people actually learn how to use digital tools from other people during the pandemic. And if you do the age breakdown, you see that actually the people who are tend to be teaching others are the youth. So they can play a very important role in the process of recovery and spreading digital uh, skills, digital literacy to the communities as well, which is very consistent with what we have heard anecdotally, whereby there are many young workers who emigrate back to their hometown and then end up teaching their families and communities how to use different technologies. So there we have it, um, eight ta key takeaways from this ASEAN Digital Generation Survey. One, two, and three is around understanding the deep impact of the pandemic and how that shaped the way to view the future. Four to six is about the critical role technologies, digitalization can play to help support the recovery. And seven and eight is about understanding the gaps, what we can do. Um, as a public sector, private sector, people sector, academic sector can come together to really help support our digi digi digital generations so that they can thrive in a post-pandemic world. Thank you very much for your attention. Pass back to Mbrabi. Thank you, Santi, for that uh, brilliant presentation. And uh, thank you, Juok, for uh, offering me the opportunity to moderate this session with uh, Thank you, Zafar Lassis, uh, Malaysia's finance minister, uh, Hui La, the managing director of Van Dat Company Limited of Vietnam. She's also a community champion. And of course, you just heard Santi Tan Satsuratai, the chief economist for the uh, C Group. Now, some time ago, when he was still a top banker with uh, CIMB, I profiled Thank you, in my column, In Good Company. I'm so happy I made that call because today, as we all know, Minister Zafrul doesn't just head one bank. He presides over Malaysia's entire financial system. And he's also got the reputation of being a good guitar player and singer. 
and I'm sure he's rocking in whatever he's doing at the moment. So welcome, uh, 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 Minister Zafrul. And uh, likewise, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome Hui. Uh, I look forward to hearing her views. Uh, as we all know, uh, Vietnam has gone through a bit of unusual times, I'd say. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, uh, you know, it was held up as a model of uh, healthcare surveillance and it had been Southeast Asia's biggest recipient of the outflow of manufacturing from China. But then Delta showed up and it's messed things quite a bit. Uh, Hui, we'd like to hear from you on how you and Vietnam are coping in this situation. And of course, uh, welcome Santi. Thank you for your excellent presentation of the survey just now. You know, your survey results uh, really offer very rich statistical insights to inform policy makers of the views, aspirations, and needs of the ASEAN digital generation. And I like the fact that the survey focused on the young and women. But I'd like to make one suggestion to WEF and to you, and which is to widen the definition of youth from 35 years by at least two years, maybe even five up to the age of 40. And that, that's because, you know, lifespans are increasing and that's changing our thinking on a whole lot of issues from the age of marriage to the future of work and when we retire. Uh, Santi, before I turn to Minister, could I ask you about something that crops up in your report time and time again, and that is the flywheel effect. What is this flywheel you keep referring to? And uh, could you elaborate for us on the momentum needed for further digitalization? And uh, if you could continue, you might even tell us what are the implications for the key stakeholders in the digital economy? Santi, it's yours. Thank you very much uh, for the kind words, Ravi. Um, it's a great pleasure to, um, to join this uh, very distinguished panel. Uh, it's great uh, to see you, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Safro and Huela. Um, yeah, and thank you for the question, Ravi. It, it's really one of the central findings of the report. Um, and I think to use another analogy to explain this uh, flywheel effect is that when it comes to digital adoptions, you really need to have sufficient kind of runway, if you will, for a person to really kind of take off on their digitalization journey. Um, if you have that can provide a sufficient runway, then uh, as people can get to fully experience the benefits of digitalization digital tools, whether it's e-payments, it's running business on e-commerce or whether it's e-learning, et cetera, then they become more motivated to actually um, invest or to train themselves to become upskill themselves so that they can use this technology even better. And as they become better at using technology, they will experience even more benefits, which then so on um, motivate them to do more. So that kind of virtual circle can happen if you sort of give them enough runway and really help nudge them in the right direction. So the key um, Im implications, I think there, there are many things, but if I were to focus on one uh, key implications for stakeholders and policymakers and ecosystem builders is that perhaps there are ways that you can nudge the people so that they will be willing to try and experiment using digital technology so they can get to experience the benefits firsthand and then kick starting this virtual circle that we are talking about. And I'm, I'm so glad to, to have Minister Safu here because I think you know, one of our really great example is this what's happening and what we have seen in Malaysia in programs such as the eBelia program where um, the government tied economic support programs to um, e-wallet adoptions to help kickstart not just providing economic support, but also use that to nudge people to actually um, use more digital payments. So that's a great example, you know, and, and this program, uh, which um, also uh, a good case study for how um, public sector and private sector can work together. Um, um, at, at C, Shopee is one of the partners that we, you know, were lucky to participate in this uh, great solution as well. So I think that's just one example, but um, it's definitely, you know, very much uh, in line with the key findings of, of this report. Mm -hmm. 
Santi, uh, thank you for that response. And we'll come back to digital payments uh, in a moment. Uh, Minister Zafrul, I have a question here from your hometown newspaper, The Star, and it's my friend uh, Philip Golingai asking the question. And he wants to know about the lessons uh, that COVID has taught us and uh, how ASEAN uh, can work together on, on, on coming out of this crisis. Uh, to that, I'd like to add that uh, Santi's survey, or rather the WEF C survey, it suggests that people believe that this is going to be a long COVID. And that, uh, you know, if you look at the concerns that are voiced in the study that, uh, you know, that, that's just been published, it does seem that uh, economic crisis is tipping the list of worries of those surveyed, even more than major conflicts between nations. And I mean, if you look at the newspapers, you'd think that it's all about war and coming war and all that, but people are really concerned about other issues. In fact, they seem to be most scared that large businesses are getting more powerful uh, than ever, you know. Now, you in Malaysia, you've done a lot in your country to alleviate the situation for Malaysians. But, uh, Minister, do you fear that you could run out of uh, fiscal ammunition at some point? Thank you, Ravi. Well, first of all, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, well, to answer your question, first we look at crafting the policies. You mentioned a few policies that we've done. Um, so behind crafting the uh, National Recovery Plan for, for Malaysia, the narrative has always been to minimize scarring of economic sectors. And we want to secure the livelihoods and health of our people. So we know, we realize uh, that there are potential deepening of the fault lines in our socio-economic system, right? And I think in the report also talk about, you know, the recovery will be uneven uh, and this will uh, lead to social and political instability. So the future generation, uh, as per report, is rightly worried about their own future. So our policies must help them take ownership of their future growth. So in Malaysia, of course, we are fully committed to do whatever it takes to minimize this. Uh, we've implemented eight stimulus packages worth uh, 530 billion ringgit, that's equivalent to around 127 billion US dollars. We talked about fiscal injection just now, Ravi. Our fiscal injection have been around 90 billion ringgit, which is around 21.5 billion US dollar since the onset of the pandemic. Uh, this is a testament to our commitment. Uh, we also committed to funding any development needs. Uh, recently, the government announced the five-year plan. This is our 12th Malaysia plan. And this will be complemented by our budget. Uh, I'll be uh, tabling the budget in two weeks, well, 29th of October. Uh, and we will put a strong emphasis on nurturing growth as we progress further towards our recovery, as well as transitioning, yeah, transitioning from a state of pandemic towards living with the virus under a new normal. So our recovery is secured and we have set on a sustainable path for growth. So we target to slowly decrease our fiscal deficit uh, currently, our estimate, our forecast for our fiscal deficit this year is between 6.5 to 7 percent of GDP. And we've announced that by 2025, uh, the target is to be, three, to be at 3.5 percent uh, by end of 2025. So this uh, equally important uh, ammunition or policy tool, uh, apart from fiscal policy, is monetary policy. Uh, this remains accommodative yeah, since the start of pandemic. Uh, the central bank has decreased the overnight policy rate by 125 basis points. So this policy stand is to remain you know, accommodative, to provide support to the economy while ensuring price pressures remain manageable. So no doubt, uh, Ravi, my colleagues uh, within ASEAN have been utilizing both monetary and fiscal policy tools. So uh, in terms of experiences from other countries within the ASEAN region, uh, we want to focus on jobs, jobs creation. I think uh, job recovery is crucial. So we have set up the National Employment Council, or NEC, right? Uh, and to this will help look at providing employment opportunities on a placement basis in the short and medium term. So we have seen the result of this. We had unemployment rate of 5.3% in May last year, and now it's gone down as August is around 4.6%. We've also introduced other initiatives to address underemployment and also to ensure job retention. We also allocated for wage subsidy uh, to date, we have 
uh, allocated around 20 billion ringgit of wage subsidy. That's around 5 billion US dollars for wage subsidy programs. But also important, Ravi, is the need to strive for an equitable and inclusive recovery. I think this is mentioned in the report. We want to narrow the inequality gaps between gender, ethnicities, and geographies. So we can see the efforts uh, being made to address this issue. Uh, this is a structural issue, uh, not just in Malaysia, but also uh, throughout, uh, various, uh, throughout the world, actually. Uh, so we have in our plan, in our 12 Malaysia plan, also in the upcoming budget to focus on these areas. And the other is thing that is important is digitalization. Uh, this is another uh, important pillar for economic recovery, particularly for the micro SMEs. So this mirrors uh, the response in the report, yeah, where 60% agreed against uh, of, of the importance of, uh, of, of digitalization and overall, where 60% agreed against an overall 54% uh, at, the, at the ASEAN level. Minister, uh, thank you for that response. Uh, as you know, the World Economic Forum has been doing tremendous work on the future of jobs, and I'm sure that there'll be plenty of opportunities for WEF to collaborate with ASEAN governments on this very critical issue. Thank you for your response. Hui, uh, coming to you, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, you know, Vietnam was held up as a model of uh, health surveillance. Tell me what went wrong, uh, so wrong that there have been supply chain disruptions. And uh, how have you been coping? And as a business leader yourself, what are the lessons that you've taken away from it? Thank you, Ravi. Um, good afternoon, everyone, um, and hello from Vietnam. It is my great pleasure to be here and to participate in this um, distinguished panel. So um, as you might already know, the fourth wave of COVID hit Vietnam just after we were hailed as one of the most successful countries in containing the pandemic. So in Ho Chi Minh City in particular, my beautiful hometown and Vietnam's economic hub, we actually began the year on a very bright note with a recorded growth rate of 4.65% in the first quarter and 6.61% in the second quarter as compared to the same period last year. So starting in May, Ho Chi Minh City became the epicenter of the fourth wave with thousands of cases per day from the Delta variant. It happened unexpectedly and we were quite unprepared. So we started lockdown from May 31st, initially with Directive 15 for social distancing, then Directive 16 with strict lockdown restrictions for everyone to stay home. For us businesses, we had two choices, to either close temporarily or to apply the three taikyo, stay on site policy starting from July 15 in order to stay open. Um, in which the workers and employees must work and live on site at companies, factories, or have a designated resting location and can only travel to and from there. Evidently, this caused a heavy disruption in supply chain, including logistics, delivery as shippers were restricted to only able to deliver essential goods and within the, the same district. As a result, Vietnam's GDP shrank by 6.17% in the third quarter, with the unemployment rate among the working age population at 3.98% uh, in this third quarter, which equivalent to 1.8 million jobless people, the highest that we've ever had in 10 years. Um, fortunately, Vietnam is slowly opening up again for economic recovery from the fourth wave, but continues to be accompanied by safety measures and risk management, including having the green pass requirement, which means that you have to be fully vaccinated, um, health declarations and testing, as we have to embrace the fact that we, we're, we have to live with it now. Many businesses and services, including my, uh, our company, have reopened again, except for dine-ins restaurants, and domestic flight routes are starting to resume again. So for our company, um, we're a manufacturing and warehousing real estate company. We applied the 3T policy for a couple of weeks initially, but unfortunately had to stop due to the high operation cost and safety concerns for our workers. With the main challenge being testing workers regularly every three days, which could easily cost thousands of US dollars every month and resulted in super sky high operating costs. 
On the other hand, warehousing is doing a little bit better, um, especially for logistic clients, and I am very grateful for that. So when it comes to lessons, I think um, uh, I can come up with a couple of keywords. Number one is adaptability and resilience. And these are also the, the keywords that were mentioned in the report as well. So adaptability in order to um, start embracing the digital transformation right away. We, um, now we can't go to office. We have to work from home via channels like Zoom, messaging apps, um, and embracing the different um, digital tools to keep the business open. And resilience to be responsive and problem solved right, right away. Thank you, Hui. Uh, turning back to Minister Zafrul again, uh, you know, one of the things that the survey indicates is that uh, people's expectations of healthcare has grown in the wake of COVID. Now, this is in some ways a very unique crisis because this is a healthcare crisis that came on top of an economic crisis. Because as we know, except for Vietnam, most of the regional economies had been slowing uh, before COVID arrived. Minister, from where you sit, do you think governments now need to relook healthcare policies? And do you think we need to have a much closer cooperation between uh, the government and the private sector as we prepare for the next pandemic? Mm. Thank you. Well, for your information, Ravi, we have uh, in Malaysia been working with private healthcare providers during this pandemic. Mm. Uh, since the pandemic started, we have started decanting public hospital patients to private hospitals. This obviously has significantly eased the burden of public hospitals in managing COVID-19, you know, especially for Malaysia when it peaked two months ago. Uh, also, our national COVID-19 uh, immunization program have also seen close cooperation with various stakeholders, especially with the, the, various sec, uh, the private sector. At its peak, uh, there was over 700 vaccination centers nationwide. Mm. Uh, it covers private venues like conference halls, as well as private clinics and private hospitals. And we had a, even a dedicated program to accelerate vaccination for certain sectors such as manufacturing. This was also done. Of course, there are challenges, right? This pandemic has given the opportunity uh, for governments all over the world to relook at their healthcare policies. Uh, for us here in Malaysia, we are always committed to reform our healthcare system in the medium to longer term. This is to ensure accessibility and coverage to the whole population. So according to the Malaysia Voluntary National Review, if I'm not mistaken, uh, our public healthcare system actually subsidizes up to 98% of the healthcare costs. Uh, this is, uh, you know, with more than 70% of the population depending on the public health system. Uh, well, to reinforce our commitment, uh, the government's total expenditure on health uh, has been increasing steadily over the past decade. It rose from 33 billion ringgit, uh, that's around 4% of GDP uh, in 2010, to more than 4.3% of GDP in 2019, that's around 64 billion ringgit, nearly, nearly double. So. In the terms of our annual budget, uh, last year's budget, or this year's budget, in fact, budget 2021 alone, the allocation to Ministry of Health has increased close to 8%, uh, which is now around 5% of GDP. But moving forward, we are committed to addressing the structural issues in our healthcare system. Uh, as you know, this pandemic has shown a spotlight on this matter, not just for Malaysia, but for many other countries. And we have a blueprint, uh, Malaysia healthcare system reform. Uh, this will be introduced as a new way forward for national healthcare system transformation. This was announced also in the 12 Malaysia plan. So in designing the blueprint, a study will be undertaken to strengthen the healthcare sector landscape. So the study will include public healthcare sector uh, transformation, private healthcare sector regulatory reform, and sustainable health financing. So the government has announced plans over the next five years. We want to increase the public health care charges also for higher income patients in, in aftermath of the pandemic. So we are, you know, looking at also related to this on financial uh, protection, right? So we want to encourage Malaysians, including the middle class, uh, to purchase health insurance, uh, to finance health care expenses, 
and we are looking to incentivize this by a review on the income tax reliefs on health and life. Uh, we also need to look at social protection. So social protection scheme under the various schemes that we have here in Malaysia will provide, must provide some health benefits, which we want to also expand to cover informal workers. And we also have insurance scheme for the B40. This is to cover the cost of treatment and services at private healthcare facilities, right? And we also need to, you know, look at um, ASEAN. So the region also need to spend more on public health care. Uh, at the moment, the average spending on health care is only about 4% of GDP. This is still below uh, OECD's average of between 10 uh, to 12%. So we need to simulate these investments. We must commit to increase health care spending and improve public health care partnership. Uh, and, you know, we combine this with technology, uh, the possibilities in health tech yeah, are limitless. Indeed, we've seen uh, in the report that respondents in Thailand, Singapore and Malaysia saw an increased adoption of digital technologies as the most promising uh, opportunity. So finally, um, uh, Ravi, as the virus progresses uh, from pandemic to endemic, we must increase our preparedness for future pandemics, including through ASEAN resource pooling. So COVID-19 has exposed ASEAN's inability to coordinate an effective response. So we need to invest, uh, for example, in regional disease centers, uh, R&D for vaccines, and better understanding of communicable, communicable diseases, uh, among other things. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I mean, this is a theme that I keep returning to in my Asia columns for the Straits Times, and I'm glad that I have the endorsement at the, uh, you know, one of the highest levels in Malaysia for some of what I've been trying to say in my columns. Uh, Hui, you know, to, to bring up the subject of uh, women, you know, it's probably appropriate that uh, uh, this survey, 56% of those surveyed were female. And if you look at the World Bank's uh, East Asia and Pacific studies, uh, and, you know, this survey confirms what the World Bank has been telling us, that women and MSMEs are the hardest hit by the pandemic. And that's very distressing to hear because so much of this region's economic energy comes from the small and medium enterprises. But, uh, you know, going through that survey, it also worried me that uh, when people were asked about uh, post-pandemic opportunities, just 5.2% of the respondents thought that there would be improvements in gender disparities. Now, that's quite troubling. What do you think can be done to uh, mitigate that? Great. Thank you, Ravi. Um, well, I absolutely agree that COVID-19 not only widened the social inequality gap, but also the gender and economic inequality gap. So women definitely face more challenges, including having to balance work from home and taking care of family, children, cooking, um, doing housework, and potential family tension could arise, which result in a lot of stress and a lot more mental health effects. Um, additionally, in rural areas, girls are also less likely to be invested in education as compared to boys. Professionally, women are still underrepresented uh, for tech roles like engineering. So um, we in Vietnam currently, we do have professional business organizations and community initiatives to support women in terms of fostering a supportive community, better understanding, um, coaching services, career guidance, online skill training. So for example, is the Howe organization um, in Ho Chi Minh City, which I am a member of. However, I, um, I strongly believe that a lot more um, could still be done to help women and MSMEs to um, cope with the effect of COVID-19. So these include um, promoting STEM education for women early on um, in post-secondary education to increase the digital literacy um, via having more scholarships and internship opportunities. And I believe that the most important things um, as business leaders is that companies need to be aware and more unbiased in their hiring decisions, especially for tech roles, and initiate um, more programs to further support women, knowing that um, the stress is higher and there's a lot more challenges that we face. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Hui. Minister, uh, turning back to you again uh, as a policy setter, uh, mm. 
you've spoken quite a bit about uh, you know uh, aid to various sectors and uh, healthcare and all that, but do you think you've done enough for the SMEs and the women in your country? And has this region done enough? Thank you, Ravi. Yeah. Well, the what we've done here in Malaysia, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, our intention really is to minimize the economic scarring uh, and to assist the, those that are affected. Um, so this include the women, uh, the MSME, right? Uh, both groups are definitely uh, one of the hardest hit groups in Malaysia due to the pandemic. Uh, for example, SME, MSME, the micro SME, is an important sector. Uh, if you look at Malaysia as a context, more than 95% of Malaysian business entities are MSMEs. And for SMEs, uh, they con uh, contribute close to 40% of our GDP. Therefore, it is only natural uh, that uh, we here at the government focus in assisting these groups. Uh, we have allocated close to 30 billion ringgit or uh, ringgit worth of direct cash assistance. This is via grants, right, for MSME. Uh, and also for grant directly to SME, MSME is about 6.1 billion ringgit. And I mentioned just now about the wage subsidy, that's close to 20 billion ringgit. And due to the pandemic, our women, you know, have suffered even more, right? We need, and this data shows that, even in Malaysia, the data shows that, and we need to do something for them as they are pillars of our society and form half of our population. So in terms of assistance for women, especially entrepreneurs, we have dedicated microfinancing schemes. Uh, we have uh, a women's called Permakasa Nita, which is a women empowerment uh, microfinancing scheme. We have allocated 50 million. Uh, this is provided by our National Savings Bank uh, to encourage women entrepreneurs to venture into business. We even have another close to 95 million ringgit uh, through our other various government agencies to empower entrepreneurs in the country. On top of this, we also have a matching fund. 70% 70, 70 matching fund will be provided for women entrepreneurs and self-employed women who subscribe to our self-employed social security scheme. So those are some of the effort that we want, uh, we've done uh, to improve, um, uh, empower women. Uh, and in the 12 Malaysia plan as well, the, we have to include a gender empowerment framework, uh, this as well as strengthening our legal framework in tackling issues uh, related to women. So re reasonable changes to improve access and quality of care services, you know, early education for children to encourage more women uh, to continue working or return to work. All this are part of our plan. And in fact, by 2025, our target is to have women's participation in the employment market to reach 59%. Uh, percent. And we've seen on the development, uh, when it comes to women entrepreneurs, uh, we will be boosted uh, by what I've uh, discussed just now. We want to increase access to funding and also, more importantly, skills training. Uh, women entrepreneurs will be encouraged to conduct their business activities online yeah, uh, in order to expand their market. So overall, we will continue to prioritize uh, micro SMEs, SMEs, and of course, women uh, in the upcoming budget 2022 as well. Thank you, Minister. You know, just staying on the subject for a little bit more uh, and some results coming out of the survey, which shows that 64% uh, of respondents have digitalized over half of their business tasks. Minister, I was looking at some data from the United States, and uh, if you look at total factor productivity in the U.S., it seems to have leapt up thanks to digitalization. And coming out of COVID, I mean, at some point we have to look beyond COVID, do you think uh, that uh, we in ASEAN and uh, maybe in Malaysia to start with could get high quality growth thanks to the digitalization that's been recorded by, uh, you know, uh, Santi's study? Uh, what are you seeing in Malaysia? Well, definitely uh, what we've seen is the pandemic has accelerated the adoption of technology, uh, not just Malaysia, but you know, everywhere in the world. And to share, just to share with you, in Malaysia, during the lockdowns, uh, although some companies uh, were not full, working at full capacity, employment and total hours worked in the second quarter of this year improved against a lower base during the same period. So basically, at the same time, yeah, our economy increased 16.1%, and this translated to the increase in labor productivity uh, per employment by 13.6%. And therefore, 
our labor productivity per hour worked dropped 12.8%. So that shows that productivity is increased. Um, in order to you know, further invest and entrench technology in operations, uh, we need to really invest in R&D and innovation. Uh, and if we've succeeded, uh, Ravi, I think, I believe that the TFP of ASEAN economies will rise significantly. Uh, in Malaysia, we are seeing encouraging signs uh, that digitalization will increase our TFP in the medium to long run, uh, especially I've seen it in, you know, as a former banker myself, we've seen this in our financial services and also the manufacturing sectors. Uh, we need to, uh, government need to play a role. We need to provide various incentives to push for our businesses to embrace uh, digitalization. On our kind also, we have established an agency called Laksana, uh, which is now leveraging data to track the performance of ministries and agencies, as well as the outcomes of our assistance and stimulus packages. So we need to have a more collaborative approach uh, to sharing technologies. You know, data must be made more available. Uh, we want to see how this can drive collective benefits. We can use the data uh, to, for poverty reduction, uh, climate change adaption and mitigation. There are many uh, object, uh, purposes of this, right? So in terms of Malaysia's response, um, you know, we, we are doing what we can uh, and we are also investing in 5G infrastructure. Uh, we're also looking at maximizing the industry's potential uh, to leverage the development of digital technology on Malaysia's creativity as well, you know, innovation, uh, while preserving our uh, invaluable national uh, culture uh, and heritage. So enhancements of this growth sector enablers will increase revenue and job opportunities, uh, definitely, uh, for, uh, for Malaysia and ASEAN. And these efforts will facilitate uh, the growth uh, of, of, of the region. Thank you, uh, Minister. It looks like the next time Santi does his survey, the results are going to be even more dramatic than what we've seen this year. Thanks uh, uh, for your response. Hui, I want to come back to you again uh, as a business person, as a manufacturer, as a distributor. You know, uh, we, we, all of us have grown up with this whole uh, concepts like just-in-time manufacturing and all that that the Japanese taught us for years and many of us try to emulate uh, some with moderate success some less so. Now, what are the lessons that the disruptions of COVID have taught you from a manufacturing perspective? And I hear that you have some uh, interesting uh, innovations in uh, Vietnam. I don't know what you call it, uh, the, uh, uh, the three uh, Tai Cho. Uh, could you just explain to us what that means and how do you implement it? Absolutely. Thank you, Ravi. Um, so during the COVID lockdown, during our fourth wave, we have to initiate the three Taikyo stay on site policy. So as I briefly mentioned before, this policy means that um, businesses can still open and operate. However, the workers, employees, everyone who are on site must work and live on site. Um, or to have a designated resting location and can only travel to and from there uh, for one route only. So for this um, policy, we, there, are, there are definitely pros and cons. So the pros is that businesses can still be alive. We can still keep up with the production schedules. However, the biggest con is in terms of operating cost. In order for this 3T, we call it 3T or 3 Taiyo policy to work, the number one crucial factor is that um, the company needs to have a big enough facility or warehouse to set up tents for each worker and make sure that each person is at least two meters from one another, because that is one of the uh, safety requirements that we must abide to. So, um, Fortunately for at our warehouse, we have a big enough facility in order to, to do so. However, there I know a lot of um, MSMEs who are also doing the 3T policy, they, they don't have the, the necessarily um, capacity in order to, to do it long-term. Um, additionally, the cost is also high in terms of testing. So we are required to test our workers regularly every three days. So this um, could easily make the cost skyrocket it to become thousands of US dollars every month. Um, as well, coupled with um, 
F and B pricing and um, all the different factors that make it a very challenging policy. So um, as mentioned briefly um, before that we, we, we uh, did the 3T policy for a couple of weeks. However, we have to stop. And again, the biggest lesson that we learned is that flexibility and adaptability is extremely important, especially during this tough time. We have to be flexible because we literally, for our company, we rolled out the policy only 24 hours, actually less than 24 hours um, from receiving the, um, the order from authority to actually establishing and launching the policy. So we have to act fast, uh, problem solve, brainstorm, and be very flexible. At the same time, we are also very grateful for um, the workers and the staff who participated in the 3T uh, program. And I know that um, some of the, um, the companies are also host um, activities like uh, karaoke session, um, chatting, sharing session to help um, with the mental health um, of the workers and make it a more um, suitable environment. Thank you. We, you know, I mean, I was just thinking to myself, uh, flexibility and adapt adaptability is such an ASEAN theme. You know, I mean, we are the bamboos of the world, uh, bending this way and that way and uh, adapting and flexible. Santi, I can't resist asking you this question because I know your company rests on, on a tripod. Uh, you have the game section called Garena, and then you have Sea Money. And, but I'm asking you from the perspective of Shopee, uh, you know, how do supply chain issues affect a firm like yours? And uh, from where you sit and, uh, you know, your own training and experience as an economist, uh, are you seeing the evolution of new models of supply chains uh, in manufacturing and distribution coming up in the digital age uh, that you propound uh, so uh, competently? Yeah, thank you, Ravi. Uh, it's a really good question. I, I think one of the uh, key findings that we have, I think, you know, from the report itself, but also looking beyond that, is that digitalization has opened up new opportunities and new ways for the micro SMEs to participate and be part of the supply chain. And I think that's, uh, you know, something that's, that's very exciting opportunities uh, going forward as well. Uh, what I mean by that is, um, in the past, um, if you are, you, you can be a really, you know, good uh, manufacturers or, or producer of some products, you know, it can be local um, fashion products or local food products. And then typically your market will be very much constrained to your uh, immediate um, neighborhood or, you know, at least your province and most your province. But what happened after digitalization comes along and um, technology like e-commerce and platforms is that it allows this uh, very micro enterprises to have access to actually nationwide market and they can be discovered by various wholesalers, by retailers, and, and also by, by exporters who become known to this product. Um, and then once they know this product, they can take this product and expand it even further. They can scale it. Um, they can take it and try to help um, the, 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 the sellers export to overseas markets. And sometimes it also provides new opportunities where these SMEs can be connected to consumers um, abroad themselves as well. Sometimes they may not even need to go through all this supply chain process and they can be connected directly to um, you know, um, uh, consumers in, in the neighboring markets. And that's something that you know, we're trying to help them as well as they overcome and develop themselves from uh, micro sellers to become full-fledged uh, exporters. So it provides new ways for SMEs to participate in the supply chain. So that's from the kind of supply, uh, from the SME perspective, which I think it's crucial, you know, if you want to kind of drive more inclusive growth and allow them to be part of supply chain. But it's also beneficial from the supply chain resilience perspective, which I think is, you know, such a key word um, that, 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 you know, Huela also mentioned just now that we learned that to have this kind of flexibility, adaptability and diversification of risk so that if, part of the supply chain is get disrupted, can we source the products, uh, similar products from another part quickly? Having a much more diversified um, producers and players in, in that ecosystem is crucial. So you having more SMEs is not only good uh, from the perspective of SMEs, but it's also good from the perspective of consumer because you have much more mm -hmm. diversification, more players that can fill in the gaps wherever there's disruptions. 
Santi, thank you. Uh, Minister, I'm going to end this session with a final question to you. And uh, this comes out of this survey that uh, the WEF C collaboration has produced for us uh, this year too. Now, two thirds of those surveyed have identified payments as a key area for digitalization. Now, if you compare with say China, uh, mm -hmm. you know, countries like Malaysia and Singapore still use uh, quite a bit of cash in transactions. And uh, is this deliberate or do you see ourselves moving towards a cashless society? Or do you think there's some merit in keeping a portion of the economy and transactions in cash, Minister? Thank you, Ravi. Well, I, you know, Santi mentioned just now that the pandemic has accelerated the shift to online shopping and e-commerce, I think, which generally also involve cashless payment options. Um, we in Malaysia have many, many e-wallet players and uh, we have many digital banking pioneers as well. I think Shanti just now mentioned about e-Balia. Uh, it's about e-Balia, it's e-youth, uh, the wallet program, uh, because they've got a lot of uh, support uh, from this segment of, of our society. Um, I think my view, uh, Ravi, the claim that we still use a lot of cash uh, in transactions are not entirely true. Uh, in Malaysia, in just one year, yeah, up to June uh, this year, we have seen e-wallet volume increase about 89%. Uh, that's around 468 million uh, transactions. And even merchant, merchant are participating. Uh, and we've seen the QR payments uh, jump to uh, 1 million uh, registrations. And of course, online banking has been improving steadily. But last one year, especially, it's gone up to 12.1 billion transactions. That's an improvement of 36%. So this corroborates uh, with the finding of the report where 66% of the uh, respondents want to use more digital tools for payments. Uh, maybe the older generation uh, may, you know, <laughs> have slept with their money under their pillow, but the youth these days will sleep with their phones under their pillows. Uh, moreover, I think it was highlighted in the report, uh, digitalization has a, you know, profound flywheel effect, which was again explained uh, by Santi just now. So most of the respondents want to digitalize their lives. And this trend uh, is even more pronounced in MSME owners who are you know, now relatively digitalized, which holds true for Malaysia as well. And we have seen many studies and they found that contactless payments have become the preferred payment options uh, for Malaysians in light of the pandemic. Uh, so this acceleration in digital payment adoption is also part of our you know, robust financial technology ecosystem, our fintech ecosystem. And the World Economic Forum also has this index, the Network Readiness Index, which measures the propensity for countries to exploit the opportunities in the internet sector. And we are placed in Malaysia at 34th spot ahead of many emerging economies. So we look at it, uh, even for direct government aid, um, there is only a small percentage of you know, all the aids that I mentioned, 33 billion ringgit directly cash to our uh, uh, the vulnerable segment of our society. Only approximately 1% was paid in cash. Uh, the main bulk of the aid were disbursed on a cashless basis, including all, nearly all application process which are done online. So digitalization is a new currency. Uh, customer data is a new capital uh, for business. So that's my uh, view on how we are, have accelerated uh, in the use of digitalization, this digital uh, in our payments. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, it's 5 p.m. in Singapore, and uh, that brings us to the end of the hour. I've done many uh, WEF uh, seminars, and I have a wonderful track record of stopping these things uh, pretty <laughs> much on time. So I'd like to keep my record clean. So l let me wrap this up by uh, saying a big thank you to the panelists, uh, Huila, uh, thank you Zafru Laziz and Santi for your participation, and also to the WEF and uh, C Limited for this uh, excellent survey. Uh, it's bound to be studied with great interest by every government and uh, company in this region. Uh, you can read more on the survey on our website uh, straightstimes.com. 
and watch this virtual briefing session again on the Straits Times YouTube channel and the Asia News Network website, asianews.network. Good day, everybody, and stay safe.